Thank you, Sean. So this is Adam Walton on BBC Radio Wales with you until 10. Lots of excellent music for you, but a particular focus on The Cure because I'll be speaking to Simon Price about his new book, Curepedia. What's your favourite Cure song? Get in touch, we might play it. BBC Radio Wales. We might. Could be this one. I think that was the very first Cure song that I heard on the radio, probably on Radio 1. Could have been Radio Wales. Did Radio Wales exist by then? I think it did. Anyway, kind of 1985-ish and just being utterly entranced uh, by how kind of uplifted and daft it sounded and all of these things um, kind of melted into uh, the video as well. I'm um, just seeing the video on it wouldn't have been the chart show, maybe you know Top of the Pops with the fluorescent socks and everything and just how outlandish uh, they looked but how great a song that was first and foremost in between days and that started a, a lifelong love affair uh, for me with the band that meant um, such a lot to me since I was 13, 14 years old and tonight I'll be speaking with Simon Simon Price, eminent Welsh music journalist who's written uh, biographies of the Mannix, you know, highly acclaimed biography of the Mannix. Also, I think, you know, um, staff writer or music writer at The Independent, lectures in music, um, hosts and promotes his own nights down in Brighton, uh, where he currently resides. And, and it's a really, really interesting book covering every aspect of The Cure. So if you're at all interested in The Cure um, or they've ever been part of the soundtrack to your life, You'll have plenty uh, to enjoy between eight and nine when I'm speaking to Simon and get in touch with us to tell us what your favourite Cure song is. You can tweet us um, at Adam Walton, text us 8, 10, 12 or WhatsApp us. This is Adam Walton on BBC Radio Wales. My special guest tonight is Simon Price, eminent music writer, um, written for Melody Maker, The Independent, many others, wrote a brilliant biography of Manic Street Preachers. Um, he's a lecturer, promoter, um, DJ. Have I missed anything out there, Simon? That's pretty much it, you know, uh, juggler. Uh, um, yeah, thank you for yeah, that you're introduction. Not, <laughs> you're not here to talk about juggling. Um, in, in many ways, because, you know, um, you're here because of your astonishing book, um, Curepedia, obviously focused on the cure. And in many ways, that song was the start of everything, wasn't it? Why? Yeah, David Bowie was one of this sort of holy trilogy of influences on Robert Smith, along with Alex Harvey and Jimi Hendrix. You could maybe add Pink Floyd into the mix, but yeah, Bowie was um, absolutely a massive influence on on robert not just musically but just his his way of of being in the world you know and that tv clip um, i i don't remember the tv clip i was just a little bit too young i think um to have been kind of cognizant um at the time yeah but, but tell us about that and and i mean there are many artists who cite uh, this particular television appearance as being key to their their genesis yeah. Yes, yeah, true, isn't it? When you listen to anybody from that early 80s generation who would have been in their early teens in the 70s, they always talk about the Starman moment and how just seeing that song on Top of the Pops was transformative for them for so many reasons, partly Bowie's kind of alien, androgynous appearance, but the way he sort of dangles his finger, points his finger down the lens. He says, I had to phone someone, so I picked on you. And it's as if he's talking directly to the viewer. It's extraordinary. And even, and this seems crazy now, but the fact that he put his arms around Mick Ronson's shoulder um, just seemed really transgressive at yes. the time. You weren't allowed to do that. Men weren't allowed to show any kind of intimacy or affection towards other men. So, um, yeah, I, I think a whole generation just looked at that and thought, this is me, you know, this is speaking directly to me. And uh, I, th I think people like The Cure were very much uh, Bowie's children, if you like, um, spiritually. Yeah. Um, why did you want to write a book about The Cure? Not just a book, such mm. an exhaustive, and I'm sure exhausting. <laughs> exhausting, to, yes. to, to write. <laughs> it's not It's not at all exhausting um, to read, but it yeah. is written, it's approached as if it is an encyclopedia. It's alphabetised and there's entries for each of the songs, yeah. albums, various, you know, drinking, pissing, various different aspects of, of their life and an approach to life. Why did you decide to approach it like that rather than as a traditional um, narrative driven biography 
I can't claim credit for this. All I know is um, I didn't want to be a one-hit wonder. I'd written this book about the Manics that did really well, and I didn't want to be like Four Non Blondes or Martha and the Muffins and just have the one hit. Um, and um, yes, the publishers, you did. uh, <laughs> you'd have loved to have Actually, done yeah. Echo Beats. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. Carry on. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I'd, I've been talking to uh, this guy called Lee Braxton at White Rabbit, um, the, the, the head of that uh, imprint, for, for a long time about just, just trying to find the right fit for me because I knew I wanted to write another book. And um, it was he who approached me with the idea of doing an encyclopedia of The Cure. And I thought about it. And, and here's the thing. Life is chaos. Life is messy and untidy. And the job of a biographer is to try and apply order to that chaos. And I thought, you know, an alphabetical order is as good as any, really, um, or as bad as any. But the format allowed me to take an approach which sort of liberated me from doing a straightforward timeline. And it allowed me to jump back and forth between eras and, and, and draw connections between things that might not seem connected. So obviously there are essays on every band member, every album, every single, as you'd expect. But I've also uh, done essays on topics like, like as you say, you know, sex, politics, religion, mm. literature, alcohol, drugs, hair, makeup, mental illness, uh, Englishness, football, drowning, dreams, you name it. And now uh, that, that kind of suits the way I write. It's it's how I wrote my book on the Mannix. Um, and it's how I look at music. I'm, I'm always fascinated by the other stuff, the peripheral stuff, the social and the cultural context beyond just the music itself. And, and it turned out that um, The Cure are a particularly rich band for writing in that way because there are so many allusions and associations and external references in, in, in what they do. Yeah. In, in the introduction, um, I say, it turns out that writing a book about The Cure means writing a book about everything. And yeah, it really felt like that. It was an insane undertaking, really. Yeah, and and a lot of bands, not necessarily of, of that era, but certainly the, the preceding era, have been kind of almost overwritten about, whereas The Cure haven't been overwritten about. Is there any particular Oh, there particular are plenty reasons? of books. There are books, but there aren't, uh, there, there's there not are. as much. They're not, they don't crop up, for example, as frequently on on music magazines wanting to kind of, I don't know, understandably sell their latest monthly edition. They're not as fetishised, I don't think. I can't even say it. So so is there any particular reason for that, or have I just missed and some it? Some of it is... Some of it's generational, you know, that um, when, when the sort of heritage mags like Mojo and Uncut started out, it was all the Beatles and mm. Dylan over and over and over. And I think there's a bit of a shift happening now, just demographically, that people of my generation are, you know, maybe <laughs> um, sitting down, sitting back and taking stock and uh, want to see their own youth reflected on the front covers of magazines. So it is starting to happen. There, there have been some excellent books on The Cure. You know, I, I am to some extent standing on the shoulders of giants, but I wanted to do something different. And the absurd insane undertaking which i underwent was was to uh, try and delve through and sift through the entire global knowledge about the cure every interview i could read every radio um piece from 40 years ago um i've, I've got a shed full literally a shed full of music magazines uh just watching every tv appearance and all of that and just trying to make sense of it all Mm. And <laughs> that, that's why it's so long. It's, it's half the length of the King James Bible. I did some stats on it. <laughs> um, given, uh, we'll, we'll play your first musical choice now. Yeah. How do you how do you feel about the musically having gone to those great Herculean um, lengths to, to put this book together? Oh. Can you still listen to them? I went through a long, long period in the middle where I thought I never want to hear The Cure again. But then when it got towards the end, something changed. And I, I actually really, really like them again, you know. And um, they're, they're one of that special handful of bands that really mean something to people. And I was one of those Cure damaged teenagers way back in the 80s. I can never not be that. And the the, the privilege of writing a book about them all, all these years later was trying to make sense of that. And and it, it, it never leaves you. You know, I, I always say you're never an ex-goth. You're a recovering goth. <laughs> OK, well, we'll play A Forest now as your first choice. Yeah. We'll talk about why um, in mm. a moment. But I can't imagine what it must have been like to hear this for the first time back at the time. Um, so, yeah. yeah, this is The Cure and A Forest. 
so beautifully bleak. Um, that's The Cure and a forest kind of brutalism with a flanger pedal. And to Simon Price, uh, the writer of Curepedia, um, a new book about The Cure, is our special guest tonight. Why did that speak to you, Simon? Yeah, it's a good song for Halloween week, that, isn't it? It uh, is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was the first Cure song I ever heard. Um, I remember distinctly hearing it on the Top 40 Countdown on Radio 1 um on my transistor radio on the school playing fields and i was about 12 at the time and and i wasn't ready for it yet but something about it nagged at me like what is this where where's it coming from not not literally like crawly but um <laughs> you know what, what, what's it trying to say and, and it, it was there waiting for me for when i was ready for it and i think it's the first time they nailed down the cure sound particularly on that album 17 seconds and um Actually, it's it's the first entry in Curepedia. Um, I, I cheated slightly by insisting that the indefinite article is part of the title. <laughs> um, so that there's there's so much um, deep folk memory attached to forests, I think, in, in Western culture. So in the entry about a forest, I've, I've written a whole chapter just about that stuff, really, from the teddy bear's picnic to the evil dead via Macbeth, Brothers Grimm, Swamp Thing and The Sopranos. Because um, I, I think we bring all those cultural associations with us when we hear a song like A Forest by The Cure. And uh, just to give people a, a taste, by the way, of, of the book, the excellent music website, The Quietus, actually ran that chapter as a little preview of the book. So if people want to go and see that, they'll get an idea of what I'm talking about and yeah. the uh, perhaps absurd stretches I go to with my writing about what is essentially a pop song. Yeah, it, there's, <laughs> it's really interesting because that period, you know, when it, when it came out, so very early 80s, was a bleak period, um, you know, yeah. right, I was going to say in the middle, I don't know whether that's kind of chronologically correct, but of, of nuclear paranoia. Um, and I think yes. that that's one of the reasons why this song particularly spoke to me, and especially someone living, you know, I lived, grew up in, in North Wales, obviously uh, um, you grew up in Barry, I think, didn't you? So removed yeah. from the, yeah. trying to work out whether a nuclear bomb going off over Manchester or Liverpool was going to obliterate me or my family. They, they were kind of the, the things that, that, you know, me and and, and you, I'm sure, were, were trying to consider at the time. And this was the perfect soundtrack to that for some reason. Yeah, I remember thinking, oh, there's an arms factory in Lanishan and uh, some of the parts go through Barry Dock and I can see Hinkley Point Power Station across the water. What's going to happen, you know? But yeah, you're absolutely right. I think goth in general was a reaction to nuclear paranoia. The The idea that, not that we might just all die in a, you know, terrible conflagration, but that, it, that we were definitely going to, and it was just a matter of when. And some bands, you know, sort of Duran Duran wing of pop or wham, reacted to that by, you know, let's party. If, we, if we're all going to die, let's have a good time. But uh, you, you had this this other um, fear-stricken, um, dread-filled uh, strand of music by bands like The Cure. And I, I really do think that feeds into it consciously or unconsciously, yeah. Well, we'll get to when The Cure also managed to do that as well. And, you know, the kind of mm, yeah, glorious um, pop well, songs. Those, up. those fantastic up kind bit, of, yeah. you know, contradictions um, within them. We're, we're going <laughs> to play possibly, we could have a deep, profound discussion about what their most nihilistic moment is. But I will play 100 yeah. Years in just a moment, uh, again, in its entirety. I remember hearing this for the first time on the concert live album. Um, I don't know, yeah. 13 or 14 years old. And, and that first line is a killer line in so many respects. Um, we won't give it away until we play the song, perhaps. But but Robert mm. Smith was, I mean, he was, you know, he was into his philosophy. He was a great reader um, and, you know, a particular lover of poetry I've picked up um, from the book. So were those things fueling his sense of, of nihilism, his sense of, of where he did or didn't fit in, in this bleak landscape in which The Cure were making music? Yeah, you're absolutely right to cite poetry because he was a big fan of T.S. Eliot and Baudelaire and uh, Dylan Thomas particularly, actually, to give a Welsh connection. Um, and uh, f in terms of philosophy, Albert Camus, the song Killing an Arab, of course, was inspired by L'Etranger, The Outsider. Um, and all of this stuff bent his young brain, really, and uh, certainly did didn't help to uh, lighten up his... Uh, <laughs> already bleak mindset and yeah the the lyric that you allude to is one one of the the darkest opening lines of, of any any song uh 
but the song's packed with other disturbing imagery about sharing the world with slaughtered pigs and so on. And it, it's it, the song has a special status, I think, which is why I gave it its own chapter in the book. Even even though it's not a, not a single, it, it's the first song on their most extreme album, Pornography, and it's the most extreme song on that album. Mm. And what was what was fueling? Got to be careful how I word this, perhaps. But what was feeling mm. the, the 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 sense of almost anguish, despair, displacement that's very apparent not just on this song but on this album? There are a lot of things going on. I mean, there were um, the deaths of family members that had, had happened recently. There was disillusionment with the religion into which Robert and Lol Solhurst were were both raised, uh, which is Roman Catholicism, and. Uh, a lot of drugs in the mix. We can't uh, skirt around that, and um, just just that kind of uh, dark cocktail of uh, factors led to that mindset and and made it the album that it is. And and it's definitely an influence, I think, on on the Holy Bible by the Manics. Yes, uh, I, I'm just going to ask I, you I'm about that. I'm incapable of getting through anything without talking about the Manics. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you um, about that because there's 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 lots of similarities, even in things like guitar sounds. And um, obviously, that yes. kind of the way that Richie yeah. Edwards and, and Nicky Wire wrote lyrics, there is some, um, I think, echo in in Robert. I mean, Robert Smith tends to be a little bit more direct, um, perhaps. I mean, you you were skirting around drugs there, but if we look at um, hallucinogens as, as kind of some kind mm. of um, influence on proceedings, um, and we look at other music so if you look at the Beatles Sgt Pepper famously um, and turned into some kind of almost like jolly playground ride obviously The Cure did it in a very different yeah. way I mean it was almost like determinately a bad trip were they trying to put people off uh, yeah. dabbling or <laughs> experimenting in, in obviously what were and still are class A illegal substances yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's almost an experiment in what happens if you apply acid to um, an already dark mindset. You know, if, if you're a sort of blissed out hippie in the, in the summer of love uh, and, and, and we're taking LSD, the, the results were maybe very different. Um, but this is, uh, it's kind of relentless and remorseless all the way through. And, and, and the music really reflects that. Lol Tolhurst's drumming, I think, is extraordinary on this record. Mm. I think that's him at his best, and drum programming as well. And Robert's guitar work on this track is incredible. And, you know, they, they always deny being a goth band, and I can understand the reasons, but this is The Cure at their most gothic, like it or not. The Cure and 100 Years on BBC Radio Wales. Simon Price, uh, the writer of Curepedia, is my special guest tonight. It's beautifully harrowing, uh, that Simon. Still <laughs> sounds beautifully harrowing, still gives me um, goosebumps. And it's kind of out there, but there was a lot of music that was out there um, at the time. So, um, you know, um, Unknown Pleasure or any of, uh, you know, Joy Division's albums, um, Killing Joke's first album as well. There was a kind of a nihilism elsewhere in music, but... The Cure um, seemed to prosper from it almost, but it was harrowing for them um, as well, wasn't it? And, and I think, was it the tour for that particular album that, that almost broke them, reduced them to um, just a, a two-piece and, and almost finished the band? That's right, yeah, the 14 Explicit Moments tour. This was basically the pornography album tour. Um, they were in Europe and uh, they were having fist fights after shows uh, and it all culminated in one massive argument on stage and uh, in the end Simon Gallup the bassist um, left for the time being he rejoined a few years later so it was just Lol and Robert and it looked like the end of the band but they rolled the dice um, their manager Chris Parry challenged them to try writing pop songs um, you could argue they'd already done that years earlier with Boys Don't Cry um, before the gloom set in so a little reluctantly, they did, they tried, and the results were Let's Go To Bed, then The Walk, then The Love Cats, and the first one almost made the charts, but the second one, The Walk, was a proper hit, um, reached number 12, um, got them back on top of the pops for the first time in a while. More importantly, I would say, it made them persons of interest to smash hits. Um, <laughs> so they were reaching parts they'd never previously reached. It's, it's where I got on board, for example, I was 15 years old, and seeing this on top of the pops, it, it was, yeah, you know, this, this is fantastic. But it, it is a weird little phase in their career where they are a synth duo, essentially, like Soft Cell or Yazoo or something like that. Yeah. And uh, it's it's a very danceable 
dark synth pop record. Um, do, are they, do they get enough credit often... for, for being, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but for, for embracing mm, technology no, enough? Because, um, you know, Robert Smith, especially, he didn't limit the band's kind of sonic vision. They seemed to kind of develop at every step and he was willing to embrace whatever technology he needed to to, to realise his, his, his sonic visions. I think you're absolutely right that um, they are underrated in that sense and they were bringing dance elements and electronic elements into their music at around the same time as the band to whom this is compared, New Order. Uh, uh, this this song's always compared to, to Blue Monday by yes. New Order. You know, a, a lot of people allege that it's basically a rip-off. Um, the Cure have always insisted that's a coincidence. Um, I've investigated that claim in the book, um, but I'll summarise it with a sound. Hmm. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, let's uh, let's hear the cure and the walk now. We'll, we can make our own minds up. <laughs> Cure and the walk, and it is tempting just to play the start of Blue Monday at this point, um, but I shan't. <laughs> They're both fantastic uh, pop songs yeah, in the right. I'm glad lights. that they both exist in the world. Exactly, yeah, let's yeah. just celebrate that they are both out there. Yeah, well, I would yeah. imagine on your DJ nights, it's uh, it's a, it's an obvious but brilliant segue to do um, at any given <laughs> time on a spellbound night. I'd yeah, imagine so. Anyway, that'd be very mischievous. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, in terms of Robert Smith himself, obviously he's the uh, he's the um, the omnipresent member. He is the cure. You make yeah. this point um, in the book, obviously, um, many times. And yet, the identity of the cure is really important to Robert and and this kind of revolving cast of members. People like Lol Tolhurst and Simon Gallup have, have been involved at different stages. People come back. He's got some fantastic collaborators now, the likes of Reeves and Gabriel. So, why is it the cure? Why is it never just been Robert Smith? Do you think? I think that the um, the other players have really mattered, and yeah, he hires and fires, uh, but not. It's never just um, according to to a whim. It's usually okay. In some cases, there may have been a um, irretrievable breakdown of personal relationships between the members, but usually he picks the right people for the right record or for the right kind of phase of the band. And there are all kinds of arguments within the fan base. What what is the perfect Cure lineup? What's the ultimate lineup? And a lot of people would say that the mid '80s is where they really had had the greatest musical unit, and that was Robert Smith, Lol Tolhurst, Simon Gallup, Paul Thompson, now known as Pearl Thompson, and Boris Williams. Um, so that was the lineup that made the album "The Head on the Door," hmm. um, and uh, and and the next song we're going to play is from yes. that album. And yeah. I, I think that that album, "The Head on the Door," was was a real kind of gateway drug for a lot of people um, finding their way into the Cure. Um, the song we're going to play is close to me, and and this is the song that um, made me start wearing an eyeliner and <laughs> made me nag my mum into knitting me a massive black mohair jumper like I'd seen Robert wearing, because, um, you know, it, it really hooked me in. Because um, my main love in terms of music from the past in those days was Motown, and close to me is, is like the sort of skeleton of a Motown song. Definitely. It's, it's yeah. stripped down to its bare bones, you know. There, there's this disciplined snap to the rhythm section of Simon Gallup and Boris Williams that's just superb, I and think. And the horns and, as well, you know, which, uh, you know, the horns, which is kind of an echo of Motown. Which, uh, yeah, yeah, the horns are only there on the single version, which means that when, when you play the album version, it can be a little bit of a letdown. <laughs> that you expect them to come in, and, and, and they don't. But yeah, that, that was a bit of a masterstroke. Robert wasn't even sure about it being a single. He had to, he had to be persuaded. But you, you think of that now, it just seems like an obvious single. It's it does. It's just a fantastic song. So many things to talk and, about uh, at this point, but but what I, I did um, want to ask uh, at this point was obviously the importance of the, the visuals, Tim Pope's visuals, the, the yes. videos for The Cure, especially at this point, and, you know, in between, Day started to become something that was so important to them and so important to kind of expanding um, their music to people with with obviously MTV kind of rolling out top of the pops featuring them. So tell us about that relationship and this brilliant, particularly brilliant video. Yeah, I mean, I think there were two great video bands in the 80s, The Cure and Madness. And I think Tim Pope was the reason that The Cure can be spoken of in, in those terms. The song Close to Me, you know, it sounds like what it is. It's a song about claustrophobia. Um, Robert's vocal is really up close and personal. It's, it's oppressively intimate. And this brilliant video that Tim Pope 
made emphasizes that because they're crammed into a wardrobe that topples off beachy head and starts filling with water and um in, in the book i've described tim pope as the other genius in this story because i really think he was and is okay we'll play it now Cure and close to me, Simon Price, the writer of Cure Peter, is our special guest in this hour of the programme. It's like, um, got a whole New Orleans jazz band falling over the cliff at Beachy Head there, um, Simon. Um, now, we haven't mentioned yeah. where people can get hold of the book and when it's available, because there's a couple of different versions of Cure Peter, isn't there? Yeah, um, the main version, standard hardback version, is published by White Rabbit and it comes out on uh, November the 9th. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, there's this deluxe edition, uh, which is signed by me and the um, the artist Andy Vella, who uh, designed all those classic Cure record sleeves. And uh, he's, he's done a lot of artwork in the book, which is nice. So, Did you yeah, have- two versions of it. You've got this kind of shed full of Cure-related interviews and and, and archive material. Um, Mm. Robert Smith is very, very private, especially uh, these days. Did you have any access to Robert himself, or or was the process really to to use the archive that's that's already there to, to create Curepedia from? Yeah, the second of those things. No, it was it wasn't that book. Um, in all my journalistic career, I was always somewhere just too far down the pecking order. When I was working for Melody Maker, there were other writers who were ahead of me to to meet Robert. I wrote about them loads of times. I've you know written so many live reviews and album reviews of them. Um, I actually interviewed Lol Tolhurst uh, just the other day, but nothing to do with with uh, my book, but with uh, to do with his. Yeah. Um, but no, yeah, it, it was it was very much a case of. Um, finding what they said at the time that's what interested me and and digging back through the archives and finding what their rationale was for decisions they made and what it all meant to them at the time um so it was just the mother of all research jobs and uh i I think uh if sometimes listening to the cure feels like one man's slow motion mental unraveling over a period of decades and i felt a bit like that myself sometimes i can't deny it oh well i've you know i've thoroughly and and i'm this isn't just kind of a radio pat on the back for the sake of it i've absolutely enjoyed everything that i've read so far i read all of the pieces about my favorite songs in the first instance and now i can you know dig deeper and i'm so looking forward to doing so already i've learned so much that i didn't know that's really enhanced my enjoyment of the songs just two more things before we go and will there be any foreign language versions of the book because of course the the cure have huge audiences especially in france but in south america and latin america um so yeah. so i mean that that internationality is is an important part of their appeal isn't it does american english count as a foreign language it does um, yes. yeah it's 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 being published uh, by day street in america um cause they're, they're huge over there but yeah um you're right the spanish speaking world i believe it is it is going to be translated into spanish um sometime next year um because the their biggest two of their biggest three ever gigs were in mexico you know playing to sort of 70 odd thousand people um so yeah definitely i think there's uh scope in uh, that part of the world to uh, to put the book out there and then almost finally finally i mean you were one of the first contributors to my radio show and um, back 30 years ago and your dad worked for radio wow. so, you know such a um such an important part yeah. of the staff here at the station and sadly no longer yeah. with us so um, mm-hmm. i imagine it's uh, it's in, always interesting to be on bbc radio wales a station that your dad gave so much to isn't it Absolutely. Feels like coming home. No, I, yeah, I've, um, I'm always happy to come on Radio Wales anytime. Well, it's nice to be reminded of him. Um, he was so kind to me yeah. when I was coming up and everyone else thought I was just a, a gobby get. <laughs> Your dad gave yeah, me well, any time. They still do, I think, but there you go. I think, I think for, for better or worse, my obsession with music and my habit of overthinking it and of music meaning too much to me um came from my dad so uh, i'm now um cursing the rest of the world with that by them having to read my ramblings well good luck go. good luck um sincerely with thank you Pedia. it's been lovely speaking with you and um, we don't have to yeah. say anything about just like heaven because it's perfect in every respect and anything that we do want to know we can find out from the entry uh, the extensive entry in curepedia about just like heaven simon price thank you very much for your time tonight great insight thank, into thank you for having me phenomenal band you're so welcome this is the cure, just like heaven. The 
Cure and Just Like Heaven. Once again, thank you so much to Simon Price, um, the writer, for coming in to talk to us about his book, Curepedia. Curepedia uh, will be available in November on White Rabbit Books. And there's also that um, very special limited edition signed by Simon, which sounds very tempting. Um, so the last hour of the programme, between 8 and 9, I was talking to Simon Price about his definitive Cure book, Curepedia. Um, this was my choice of song that I wanted to play during the conversation, but it's a bit long. We didn't have time. We do now. Cure and the same deep water as you from their album Disintegration. Sorry, laughing over this is the least appropriate reaction. Um, it's from their masterpiece Disintegration, and I did speak to Simon Price, eminent Welsh journalist, about the cure in the last hour. Um, pre order his book Curepedia, where you can now. Larry Sean was the only blonde goth in Abaraeron, and uh, yeah, you're, you're here now. You were, weren't you? Oh, you know what? I never, ever, ever was a goth. And I wasn't I blonde when weren't. I was in Aberaeron. Weren't you? Why? What happened? No. Did you leave? You're I'm not sorry. a big fan of The Cure, then? I like Friday, I'm in love. It's the only song that Robert Smith doesn't like. That's but Obviously. 